racial justice and equality. Apple's racial equity and justice initiative, racial justice, racial justice, increasing representation, diversity and inclusion within Apple, underrepresented groups, representation, inclusion and accountability. The future sucks. It's all AI vaping and weight loss drugs. Everything's a computer. The TV's a computer. The toaster's a computer. The lamp's a computer. I've lost who knows how many years of my life being forced to download some app I don't really want, being forced to update my password, being forced to input a passcode to update my password to download some app I don't really want. The future sucks. The only thing I like are the rockets. When I saw those big metal arms catch the Starship Super heavy rocket in their loving embrace, I don't know, I felt something. SpaceX has been landing rockets in a similar way for a while now, and it's always been impressive, but something about this one, before I even read anything about it, it was just different somehow. Something just clicked. Watching this rocket, the future seems suddenly material again. The future becomes something you can touch, something you can see. Companies like Apple, Google, and Microsoft have only gotten bigger, have come to dominate more and more of our everyday lives, and yet the only innovation they can muster is a new phone every year, is taking another crack at virtual reality. Lately, innovation has primarily taken the form of AI, a technology which few consumers seem to actually be clamoring for, but which every company has adopted as the linchpin to their success. As a side note, companies are increasingly turning toward Towards nuclear power to accommodate the increased energy demands for artificial intelligence, to which I can't help but imagine the possibility of a Amazon or Google brand nuclear meltdown sometime in the future. Would you risk irradiating your small town for chat GPT? It seems like almost every technological development of late is either frivolous, of no apparent material use, or outright dystopian. Have you noticed that commercials aren't even trying to hide it anymore? So Gemini, help my daughter write a letter telling Sydney how inspiring she is. Bay Area Company has a pendant that you wear on your neck that offers you encouragement throughout your day. The pendant is called Friend. The most similar relationship you could attribute it to might be um, a relationship with God, where it's this kind of omnipresent, all-knowing entity that you have around you. The most similar relationship you could attribute it to might be um, a relationship with God, relationship with God, relationship with God. The commercial comes out, people point out how weird it is, the company apologizes, then tries to clarify their intent. But then how do the biggest corporations in the world make this sort of mistake in the first place? Don't they have teams of advertisers and PR people working tirelessly to shape their public image? Wouldn't making sure your company's advertising doesn't resemble something out of Brave New World be first on the agenda? Is it that the people in charge of these companies are just so out of touch, or do these commercials function as a sort of scouting party, testing the waters, taking the temperature of the slow boiling frog. Because uh, do these commercials really tell us anything we don't already know? The image of a giant pneumatic press crushing out all human art, culture, and endeavor and leaving a single corporate owned identity is less a vision of things to come and more a vision of what's already happening. The idea of AI taking the reins of human emotion and experience and turning everyone into indistinguishable slack jawed lumps of flesh is just as likely to happen whether Google makes a commercial about it or not. It seems the real faux pas is not necessarily in the collective erosion of the human or the individual, but in those moments where the indignity of it becomes too blatant to ignore. One might imagine these commercials then as a sort of probing at that public indignity, looking for those avenues where that indignity might be chipped away at. Where you can chip away at someone's indignity at a thing and turn it into acceptance, then you might eventually turn it into a virtue. Yes, people are turning into lifeless blobs of computerized goo. And that's a good thing. A few days before SpaceX caught the Starship Super Heavy Booster, there was another big showing at Elon Musk's other company, Tesla. There was a self-driving taxi, there was a platoon of androids touted as being able to do menial jobs and housework. This kind of stuff, uh, I don't know how to feel about it exactly. At the very least, they provoke the imagination. Not in entirely positive ways, but it's at least something. They are again, uh, something material, something in 
the world. On the other hand, the end result of self-driving taxis and android butlers is probably only a continuation of that flight from the human and the material. A world where, God forbid, you have to get up and water your own houseplants. Where whenever you go out to eat, supposing you do ever leave the house, you can't even engage in a bit of small talk with a waiter. Then there's, of course, the consequence of automating whole swaths of the workforce. Eventually, the trucks will all drive themselves, robots will wait tables, fix the roads, babysit the kids. As always, the question is, what do you do with all the people who used to do those jobs? How does immigration factor into the equation? The rationale for which has always been, they do the jobs no one else wants to. There's always been this idea of technology as this great liberating force. Once the everyday toil of life has been done away with, then people will have more time for loftier pursuits, like art and philosophy. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. I don't know, though. It seems like life has certainly gotten easier, but people don't seem that much happier, freer, or more enlightened. It seems all people have done with all their newfound free time is watch porn, play video games, and come up with new ways to be offended. I'm concerned about this idea of disrupting or disturbing bubble tea because it's something that's Why? very there can near. be new takes on things. Sure, Nothing but I'm looking not, at not I'm, I'm looking at these two guys. No, but then there's also an issue of cultural appropriation. As far as art goes, oh damn, you mean technology is taking over that too? And who needs philosophy when ChatGPT can do my thinking for me? I think the inspiring thing about this rocket then, and about space travel in general, is the idea that maybe those robots and self-driving cars might actually be of some use, because maybe at some point we might actually have something better to do with our time. The the significance of a reusable booster rocket, as far as I understand it, is that it will make launches more cost-effective and therefore more frequent, allowing for a more stable supply chain between Earth and outer space. Human beings might one day colonize the moon, Mars, who knows? Human beings need new frontiers. Modernity can't just be a winnowing away of the material world. Technology can't just be a mechanism for self-indulgence. A civilization has to go somewhere, it has to do something, or else it starts to wither like a muscle that doesn't get enough exercise. I think men in particular need something to do. I think we have a harder time acclimating to modernity. Put a space wrench in our hands. Send us out to put up telephone poles on Mars. Then again, maybe the robots will be doing those jobs too. I don't know. We need something though. Something to stir the imagination, to stir the soul. Okay, now we arrive at the subject of Elon Musk. Elon Musk is another one of those public figures a good chunk of the progressive status quo has decided is the literal devil. He's mean, he's cringe, he's rich. Yeah, okay, but the guy's company just revolutionized space travel. The thing about these rockets and Musk's role in their success is they're in many ways so representative of not just the political but the philosophical divide in the West. Progressives don't like Musk because he's, if not conservative, then colloquially speaking, anti-woke. Certain segments of the US government seem to have it out for Tesla and SpaceX for similar reasons. This is a recent article from Newsweek called How Joe Biden Drove Elon Musk into the Arms of Donald Trump, which lists all the lawsuits the Biden administration has leveled against the companies. My favorite here is a DOJ lawsuit against SpaceX filed on August 24th, 2023 that alleges the company discriminated against asylum seekers and refugees in its hiring practices. Meanwhile, look at those companies who do play the game. Racial justice and equality, Apple's racial equity and justice initiative. Improving our uh, leadership representation uh, from underrepresented groups. Racial justice, racial justice, black owned. In our camera technology, we launched Realtone, uh, you know, a more inclusive way to capture pictures. Increasing representation, diversity, and inclusion within Apple, underrepresented groups. Particularly in underrepresented groups especially our black and brown colleagues. Representation, inclusion, and accountability. These companies make widgets and algorithms and escapist VR headsets. Now, if that's all you do, you can squeak by with this kind of diversity first, merit second philosophy. Your artificial intelligence might not be able to function at its full capacity because it's so encumbered by anti-racist dogma, but in the grand scheme of things, it's not that big of a deal, at least for the time being. On the other hand, with rockets, if the goal is to eventually put people on these things, you probably 
simply want to make sure you have the right people working on the team, that everyone is there because they're great at what they do, not because they check a box. One has to wonder if companies like Apple or Google stopped innovating precisely to accommodate this kind of self-imposed mediocrity. There's a song called Whitey on the Moon that got a bit of a resurgence a few years back as billionaires like Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson made their own trips out into space. To quote some of the lyrics here, I can't pay no doctor bills, but Whitey's on the moon. The man just upped my rent last night, cause Whitey's on the moon. No hot water, no toilets, no lights, but Whitey's on the moon. Was all that money I made last year for Whitey on the moon? You know, I just about had my fill of Whitey on the moon. The song was featured in the television show Lovecraft Country. It was in the film First Man, about Neil Armstrong landing on the moon. The thing about the progressive status quo is as much as it heckin' loves science and Star Trek, it's also possessed by the same spirit of resentment as Whitey on the moon. You can't go into space because it might upset or offend someone here on Earth. And if you do, you better make sure you operate according to all these inane ideological checks and balances. It's common to romanticize space travel with words and ideas like new frontier or colonization, but which I imagine raise the hackles of many progressives. The very idea of exploration or expansion is seemingly at odds with their worldview. I imagine there might also be some resentment at the idea that some people might actually escape progressive influence. The same way that many people who can will eventually flee the crime-ridden confines of the city to the relative peace and security of the country, so too will people be able to distance themselves from the brave new world progressives have been trying to manifest here on Earth. What do you do about those people? What do you do when you can't scold them, when you can't freeze their bank accounts? A lot of this is like the plot for Mobile Suit Gundam, isn't it? Anyway, with all that in mind, it probably shouldn't be a surprise that the new face of space travel is ostensibly concerned conservative, or why almost every other company has lagged behind. Nobody has to like Elon Musk. Nobody likes Henry Ford or Thomas Edison either, but it hasn't stopped anyone from driving cars or using electricity. It seems to me we have two possible futures to choose from, a new industrial age out among the stars or an earthbound therapy-speak technocracy. Neither one is perfect, but I have a good idea which one is worse.